we've hit the top of the hour, so I guess we should. I mean, actually, we've already started. Uh, we're talking about uh, war stories, good things, bad things, strange things. Well, have some fun. That's the idea here. You know, a lot of folks are just out for the holidays. And the fact that you could share the uh, afternoon or the morning with us, we sure appreciate that and look forward to uh, something on crazy thing that happened to you during your career. I'll, I'll stop long enough to mention that uh, Nautel and Kintronic Labs are the two companies that are mainly behind uh, covering our expenses uh, for the uh, Zoom meeting and the YouTube channel. And we thank both Nautel and we thank Kintronic Labs, Joshua King, now in charge with uh, his dad, uh, Tom, in the background. So that's all very good. As I say, our, our thought today is uh, uh, anything that, that that you find interesting about the industry or uh, attractive, uh, things that you uh, had happened that were really good. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll start with uh, the best manager uh, that I ever worked with. And I have two uh, nominees. One uh, uh, was Lee Dombrowski, who uh, went from here to Denver. And he uh, he noticed that I was out at the transmitter site working uh, on a transmitter which had suffered some serious damage before I got there. And he showed up one afternoon with a box of pizza and some drinks. And, you know, the manager that thinks about you in those terms, to me, that's important and good. Uh, the other manager uh, that hired me here to build a six tower array and new studios. Uh, we were stuck in a small building at first, uh, in the middle of town. And this guy was just relentless. He would be up until two in the morning working with uh, clients and then get up at six, five, and then do a morning show. But the thing that impressed me was he cared about his employees. And if he had something that could benefit one of the employees he would just he'd do it uh, i remember he had a goodness like ten thousand dollar trade we're talking about the late 70s uh, on uh, the chicken uh, uh, place out there not uh, kentucky fried popeyes and he would tell the staff go have lunch go have dinner get what you want uh, he had the thing up there for remotes and things, and but it was good. And he wanted the staff to have something. Uh, another another one was a diner uh, on the east side of our town. He told us to go have breakfast, and lunch. He just he th eat there three times a day. I don't care. The only one he held back was the steakhouse because he used that for the clients for the uh, sales uh, pitches and things like that. I re I remember when I bought my first VCR. And uh, one day I came back to the station and on my desk was a case of videotapes. He got it, I don't know where, but he figured I'd need it and he cared about his staff. And I, I really, I really appreciated that. Uh, my nominee for the worst general manager, and I've told the story recently, uh, I got an alarm one night on an FM station at the far other end of the city was off the air. Takes an hour door to door minimum. I got out there and I found that the lock on the gate had been changed by somebody. Pulled out my trusty file, opened the gate, got in, got the transmitter back on the air. Coming out the door, there's this little GM guy in his Mercedes pulling up into our transmitter out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I didn't even bother uh, to ask him if he was involved with the lock. He was muttering something about he didn't see me as many hours in the studio as he thought he should. And let's just put it this way. He had my keys the next day. Anyone else like to nominate one of their managers for praise or condemnation worst is ron stone 
<laughs> had him at uh, Salem. Whereabouts was that, Scott? Salem Twin Cities. Uh, he succeeded one of the best managers I ever had, John Hunt. And what did this guy do that made him top of your list? Oh, he was a lot like uh, the one you just described. He didn't think I spent enough time around the uh, station and whatnot. And, uh, you know, even though I was out doing things like, you know, field intensity readings and all that. And um, he was just he was just hard to get along with uh, for for one. And uh, I remember we were trying to. Uh, uh, we needed to get some uh, replacement uh, wireless mics because the FCC had uh, reallocated some of the UHF television spectrum. And uh, he told us, that, he told me and the uh, program director that uh, we'd have to wait. And then we asked him about it, uh, I don't know, about six weeks later, you know, state fair was coming up and he said, well, why haven't you ordered it yet? And we sat there both shocked because he never said anything. He said he was supposed to get back to us, you know. Yeah, he he pulled that kind of crap all the time. Yeah, guy once thinks you're a mind reader and you have to come up with these answers long before. Well, the mind reading part, I, I flunked. But the other one, I, I have an in-between one. Ed Manager is a perfectly pleasant person. Uh, she, like everyone else in the building, we were children. I look back and said I couldn't trust someone that young to bring my tools. And owners trusted us to run their station. But uh, pleasant lady, she didn't get engineers and didn't know much about what I did. And she would ask the studio thing. I said, well, we have one of everything. We don't have two of very many things. So a lot of work becomes all night work just because you just don't want, you know, you don't hear us go off much during the day. One morning, about 3.30, I was wiring something in the rack room. And she shows up with a guy who we all knew he was kind of a hanger on her at the station. But, and this is very important, not her husband. And she's like, she's a little drunk. She's with this guy, David, you know, you said you worked nice. I didn't realize that really happened. I said, you don't hear us go off much during the day. But the fact that I had seen her with this guy, things got a lot more cordial after that. Was that a place that had one of the bomb shelters? This was not a place where they, this was just a little strip center, you know, frontage. Uh, it was new space, but it had been, there had been no plan. It's very sad. But I just, as I figured out things or saw things to copy, I would, you know, kind of retrofit one good idea or another. But I just remember her coming in and, you know, she was having trouble remaining vertical. I not strike that. She was drunk and was having trouble standing. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, the lack of verticality would have helped the guy who uh, we all knew because he was a hanger hunter at the station. <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily alcohol related anti vertical not necessarily that's true yeah it and and later she proved to be a little bit little little things um early on she said well i see you busy you do a lot but i don't know that we're getting stuff done and she was kind of helpful on the let's work on your do list and let's work on prioritizing she was you know she didn't know anything about technology but she could build a plan and then sometime later i remember I get a business card from her with a couple of twenties wrapped around it. This is probably the early eighties and said, you've been working really hard and I appreciate it. So we turned that one into a better situation, but it began as just a, it's not a great situation, but I seem to have an upper hand. Okay. Well, I, I'm, he probably wants to sneak in unannounced, but I'm so happy to hear that Jeff is with us. Jeff Welton, who probably has some of the best, horror stories about uh, facilities, but let's uh, continue a little bit more about managers. What was the strangest bonus you ever got from a manager? A ham from for Hanukkah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that works. <laughs> but um, I, I can also give you a really bad manager story. Okay. Um, I was at a major broadcasting company and 
Um, we had much, uh, much success uh, on a new device that I helped design and we were implementing around the country. And suddenly a new manager came in and said, um, show me your uh, PowerPoint on your demonstration. I show it to him. He goes, can I have a copy of that? I said, sure. Suddenly he calls a staff meeting of every engineer in the company throughout the country trying to present my uh, presentation. So little did he know that the uh, uh, the VP uh, of engineering was on the call. And right afterwards, he calls me up and goes, David, I'm sorry that this, this guy tried stealing your work. And he goes, not only was I on the call, but uh, the president of the division was also on the call. And you'll notice that the, the guy that did that presentation is now packing his desk. So was he able to answer questions from the people in the uh, audience? He didn't offer questions. He said, this is the way it'll be. And uh, the funny thing is I had done the presentation two weeks earlier before he joined the company and uh, everybody was pretty much on board. So it was like, okay, the, everybody in the entire audience knew he was trying to steal my work right away. I remember there's a, a movie about the uh, the big eyes artist. The husband tried to uh, claim he drew it when his wife did, and they went to court and all that, and he faked a broken arm so he couldn't paint and so on. Well, I have a, a bad manager story and also a unusual bonus story. And Great. the uh, bonus was when I was working for Malwright, and it was Kany W. K. San. This would have been sometime around 1983 or 84. And we had a Christmas party up at the Claremont Hotel, very fancy place in, uh, in Berkeley, really nice Christmas party. And then at the end of the dinner, everyone got envelopes and we got to open our envelopes and inside each envelope was a hundred dollar bill. So that was our, our Christmas bonus. And then the general manager opened up his envelope from Malwright, which he planted his check and he held up a check and it was for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Ooh. And at that moment, everyone in the room felt like their Christmas bonus was really small. And that pretty much says it for that particular manager. Man, I could well imagine. Liked. I could imagine. I remember one year I got a $10 check with taxes removed so it was nine dollars and 53 cents or something like that well that's pretty good and i'll tell you my bad manager story please and that was in the late 70s i was working for kbrg at 105.3 and it was actually uh two managers uh they were uh, the carries they were pretty old then i'm sure they've long since passed um they had a manager desk that was custom built so that both of them could sit behind it in their manager chairs. And so when you would be called into a meeting, you would be facing both of them behind the manager desk. And one, one uh, Monday morning I got called in and I was uh, told that, and one of the Ampex tape recorders that they play back uh, programs on the weekend, the brokered time programs on the weekend didn't work. And so that they would be deducting the amount of money lost for not playing that program from my next paycheck. And I said, well, that doesn't sound very fair. I can't predict in advance when equipment is going to not work. And they said, well, you're the engineer. You're responsible for making sure that everything in the building is functional and ready to go. And mind you, this was just a part time job. This was probably 10 hours a week that I was working for these people. And so I said, well, okay, um, uh, if you're gonna deduct the, uh, I don't know, the $50 or whatever it is from my, my paycheck, you go right ahead. But of course I wasn't working there very much longer. I, I turned in my notice almost immediately and uh, then they were scrounging. So that is uh, my, my unusual general manager stories. That's pretty good. Your, <clears throat> your comments bring back a flood 
of incidents over the years that I can remember, and I'm sure uh, others here will chime in and, and share. Uh, I remember one, one manager, uh, just what you were talking about now, when I left that station, uh, she decided that everything they had traded out repairs on my car, she was going to take out of my final paycheck in cash. And there wasn't much I could do about it, unfortunately. But um, she suffered she suffered her comeuppance in, in due course because the station was uh, was sold and she wasn't a part of it anymore. Well, I did have an, another manager, uh, a guy named uh, Patrick Henry, and he was the owner of Key Jazz. Uh, a nice guy, loved K, loved jazz, was very into making very high quality broadcasting. The the very first prototype Orban eight thousand was actually installed at the station uh, long before they started mass production. And uh, there are a lot of good audio stories to go along with him. And he was a nice guy, but he didn't pay his, his uh, payroll taxes. <laughs> and the government sort of uh, came in and put a lien on his bank account. So for quite a few months on payday, what would happen is uh, we would all get there on payday. We'd go to the bank. We'd line up behind him. And he would deposit checks into the bank account. And then the employees would withdraw the money that he deposited before the government would seize it. So that was just one of those unusual pay occurrences. But at least at least you got paid. Uh, here, one station I Sometimes know. Sometimes it took a while. It took a while before we learned, uh, came up with the, the plan to... Uh, to have him deposit and us withdrawal on paydays. Every everybody at one station here raced down to see who could get there first. The station I worked at in Phoenix, uh, the uh, owner traded everything. He traded the morning jock, uh, air flying lessons, and uh, the only money he had coming in was from a uh, faux uh, radio school that rented uh, one of the rooms. And every payday, he was in the building for exactly ten minutes. And if you didn't find him, you didn't get, well, what you got was, uh, well, you know, it's been a difficult week. Um, uh, can I give you half the paycheck uh, and don't cash it till Monday? <laughs> that I've was, seen uh, people, yeah, there have been cases in Texas where someone would get in trouble and they would start calling a meeting just before closing time at the bank. And you'd have, you know, the bookkeeper handing out the checks at, 15 minutes till three and it's, you know, 14 minutes to the bank. And then it's the race to see who can excuse themselves for the bathroom quickest or excuse me. I think my record's running out and like, wait, we're all tape or we're all computers. Like, doesn't matter. I think it's running out. That was like my first job. You, you, they were in bankruptcy and you went in and quickly got your paycheck and ran to the bank because after number four, it might start bouncing. That's right. All right, Mr. Manager, I want to hear the end of that sentence, but I'm going to do it after I've been to the bank. Mm. Difficult times in the radio biz. And a lot of problems, as I recall, that I've had over the ages wasn't GMs. It was program director. Uh. I was out doing uh, field density measurements, monitor points one afternoon, and uh, the program director grabbed on to the two-way, and uh, which was feeding the GM as well, and says, "What's Michigan doing out there on on our on our directional during the daytime?" This isn't funny. And the uh, GM pops in and says, "Well, I'm going to ask him just as soon as he comes back." to the studio and uh, finally after they had gone back and forth about two or three times uh, debating whether it was legal or proper for me to have the DA on the air uh, I finally cracked the intercom and said uh, uh, thank you here's my two weeks notice the funniest two-way story about 79 80 when Metro Media bought KRLD from the Johnson family in Dallas, 
big news operation and all the uh, RPUs, of course, automatically were recorded back at the master control. The GM, like apparently the GM, the new GM and the people from Metro Media meet at station, walk out through the newsroom and help themselves to the keys to one of the cruisers, completely unaware that there's a 635 sitting in the floor between them or on the transmission hump between them recording the whole conversation and these guys are just unfolding the okay this is what we're going to do and this is this is how alex burton is going to be taken out and shot and you know everybody comes back and it's like yeah listen it's a surlier crowd you know this texas crowd was a lot happier to see us this morning alex burton actually was a lumberjack heard he was a canadian was that true yeah he was a canadian lumberjack and he cooked a great pot of chili reminds me of monty python you know i'm a lumberjack and i'm okay he just you know the the carol d guys it was the johnson family was like the last of the locally owned dallas stations like you can't call them mom and pops because they were all multi-millionaires anyway but it was just hey I've been mayor, I've been congressman or whatever. Hey, I, I own a local radio station. It's 50 kilowatts, but it, I own one. That was a real important thing for the big fish in the small pond in each market. Uh, I'll just uh, mention this for some of you who feel a little hard to break in. Uh, raise your hand uh, at the bottom of the, uh, the screen there. It says raise hand. Uh, raise your hand, I'll call on you and I'll let you jump in here. Uh, Chris Hill uh, raised the question here about uh, if anybody uh, in the audience today was a fan of the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network and uh, AREDN. And if he, if you are, you might want to direct uh, chat to Chris, or we can certainly bring that up later as a war story. There's no reason why not. But um, let's take a break from managers for just a moment. What's the worst transmitter or transmitter site that you had to deal with? Ken? The 1190 site in Dallas, I guess, it wasn't the worst, meaning dirtiest or grungiest. It was just the most complicated. That's what well I right? Yeah, the, th the four towers in Irving for 50 kilowatts, and then 43 miles away in Rockwell, Texas, the 12 tower, five kilowatt nighttime. And um, when Salem purchased it, I ended up having to fix it all up. And it had been done before when Susquehanna had it by Ron Rackley. And before that, it was Gordon McClendon's The Mighty 1190. And uh, I remember when Salem bought it, they were religious, so they wanted to call it the almighty 1190. <laughs> but uh, that was the most complex one. We got Tom Jones, uh, Carl T. Jones down, mm -hmm. and we spent at least six months um, with engineers in from all around the country. And we rebuilt both the phasers at, at the sites uh, put in new transmitters, put in a DX50 at the 50 kilowatt and a Gates 5 at the 12 tower. And uh, Peter Burke built us a special remote control because those 12 towers took up two positions. And um, you raise a good issue there. Some of the, you mentioned Rackley and, and some of the others that uh, I'd like to talk about some of the you know, P RPEs. Uh, one thing that not too many pe people know, or some people from Texas do know, is that that 1190 nighttime array was first built by Dave Holtzman. Remember Dave from Continental? Very well. Really, really good guy. And here's, a, here's the back end of that. While he was building it, it so happened that every other 1190 in the country was off the air on Sunday night except me in Phoenix with a 250 watt coffee pot. And I got phone calls this evening, this Sunday evening. I got a phone call from a guy in New York. He was a DXer and he was listening. 
And he told me about his favorite station in New York. I got a call from a guy in Chicago, another one from Massachusetts. I dropped the music format. I, you know, I didn't really care that much, but um, we talked for an hour about radio stations that were popular all over the country. 250 watts. And I'm going Arizona to New York. Crazy. Well, he and Steve Schott and Rick Neese were all KLIF guys. Yep. Yep. They were. Bill Putting, we got your hand up here. Yeah, I guess I can combine my manager story with my station story. It was like the first, I was, I think I was still in high school and I got a job as an engineer at a, at a, a class, a, a FM in San Fernando, California. And they had built this, the, the manager's story was that the guy, I think traded out uh, commercials for, for everything in his house and and uh, everything else in his in his life there i think there was one actually cash paying program which was a religious program on sunday morning that kind of more or less paid the bills uh, i don't know that the the owners ever got any of the money from that and he, he ended up selling the the station manager ended up selling the station 100% of the station three times to three different groups of investors uh, before he left town. And the FCC finally pulled the, pulled the station license, just kind of threw up their hands and said, you know, we're done with the fighting. It's out of here. Deleted the, deleted the, uh, the allocation, got it over with. But the, the station was, was uh, on a little hill that, that, uh, only had a, a road up to a target range, a shooting range on the back side of this hill. So they put the tower and the antenna up on top of the of the hill and ran the feed line down the hill across the back of the target range and down to the transmitter building. And I don't remember the, what kind of transmitter it was, but every time, um, somebody would would use a higher than than you know pistol uh powered weapon on the range uh they'd end up hitting the the feed line uh and and uh, that would would uh of course drive everything nuts and and in the process it would spike through the the uh teflon ring that was used as a plate blocking capacitor, uh, the Teflon ring around the around the PA tube, and a and a and a clamp piece of kind of a bent aluminum around that to to be the other half of the of the plate blocking capacitor. So we'd be up there, I don't know, a long time, uh, a, a lot of times of the year. Uh, working on that transmitter, splicing little chunks of, of feed line together to get the to get the thing back on the air. Uh, Dale Rice finally uh, got tired of replacing the the uh, Teflon sleeve on the and and ended up with a, a TV high voltage doorknob capacitor as a plate blocking capacitor instead. But uh, so those were easier to replace than than finding that that silly Teflon ring. Oh my goodness! But, but that was my my kind of like introduction uh, to to uh, to um, you know being a broadcast engineer. And I don't know that that I may have gotten paid a couple times, but for all the time I was there, I don't think that that my paychecks ever cleared the bank. I don't want to monopolize, but you guys keep awakening memories. Uh, what you're talking about right now. With the uh, with the captain and the uh, plate blocker, uh, I had an RCA uh, five amplifiers once that had a, a problem with with isolation. And the answer, you do what you have to do. This is the early eighties. Uh, the plexiglass cover on the teletype machine that disappeared and somehow ended up inside the transmitter. Brian, see your hand.
Okay, there we go. Um, my first chiefing job at uh, KSOF in Wichita, Kansas, um, had uh, an FM 5K transmitter. Uh, first time to work on a Tetrode or anything like that. Luckily, I did have some help on that. But this place had open delta power. And as a result, um, anytime there was a storm, bye-bye diode stacks. And uh, that was just the way it, the way it was. But uh, that was probably the worst place, uh, the worst transmitter facility I had to deal with. But it was early on in the career, so I knew better like, later. Thanks. That FM7, that, that was a 7.5K. That was a very curious monster. Um, first time I called Gates support and we discovered that my manual didn't match his manual, which didn't match the transmitter. But then of course the response from Gates was, we've never heard that happen before. It, it was also a rather interesting thing, uh, that the transmitter wasn't the only thing to go out, uh, but as we had a TFT remote control, and uh, I at one time I could tell you the phone number just without having to look it up anymore. So, yep, yep. Now I'm going to pop this one out, and uh, Jeff, if you want to correct me, the MFET one in the back of that MFET on the panel, I think it was five volts and 70 volts were right next to each other. And a uh, fellow that I won't name once was uh, trying to jam the power supply in there. And he used a, a wooden uh, piece, a piece of wood in the back and managed to short those two together. And uh, let's just say that in 1982, getting overnight parts wasn't quite as simple as you might think from Canada. Maybe we lost him. Back then, though, you could do uh, counter to counter um, freight on uh, airlines, which came in real handy. Yes, that's true. That's true. And uh, that's often how we had to get stuff in here. It looks like Jeff had to drop out and Maybe he'll be back. We'll see. Well, the worst site I ever had to deal with uh, probably have to be the one in James, North Dakota. Fortunately, we're out of that building now, but uh, it was an unheated Quonset hut. Uh, we had a Crown 1K transmitter, and every winter we had to wrap the rack with uh, styrofoam board and uh, with a heater directed at the transmitter to keep it running. Uh, the building was old, leaky, rodent, was rodent infested. It was just, uh, and there was really no way to get in there except via snowshoe during the winter time. So it was, uh, uh, needless to say, not my favorite uh, place. Interesting. I got a note here from Mike Shane says this is the first time he heard of customer service rep. I don't, I don't, I don't want to ask this, this one, everybody put their head. I, I think I don't know anyone that has not had Gates tell them we've never heard of that problem before. Whether that was my response. I said, that's the first time I ever heard that. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Goodness. Whether it, whether it's those, Horizontal it, tubes in the BC1G, or it was the uh, the very sharp edges on the, uh, the the value transmitters. Remember those when they didn't even bother to mill the edges of the frames. I think companies must rotate uh, rotate new customer support people in on a regular basis, so they've never heard of those problems before. Yeah, yeah. Well, some of them, but. Uh, uh, you'd be amazed over over the years the uh, different gates transfers that I've been inside of, and uh, one of them it was it it was a transistor in the oscillator 
that died when, when I found out. And I asked the guy, what could have caused this? Well, we've never heard of that happening before. <laughs> Been there, done that. I guess I got the t-shirt. Mr. Stewart, I'm going to ask a question here. And uh, I'll invite you to comment uh, first and then see what others have to say. You put together a rather uh, large engineering department uh, for what became Univision Radio. How did you manage to find good engineers in each place? What was your criteria? And don't say money. We paid reasonably well, but we weren't, it wasn't great. Uh, we also had the great luxury of never being in a huge hurry that we would add one market a year or two in a year. They might come with, with pretty good people. A lot of my job was making sure people understood that usually they would see Hispanic broadcasting or Univision and they just assumed that you needed to be anchor grade Spanish first and foremost. And I said, no, the nuts and bolts don't care. And it was uh, contract engineers, people who'd been able to run 10 or 20 stations and prioritize what needed to be fixed first. We're way ahead of, I, I'd meet a lot of staff people where some supervisor had, had portioned out the tasks. And people like that usually weren't as good because in our cities, we weren't trying, we weren't trying to centralize everything and we weren't trying to standardize everything. Um, it applied to automation, whatever you had usually was okay because for the longest until just a few years ago, they still weren't voice tracking remotely. Now they are, and now they do. But the thing was, I need you to know your equipment and I need you to, to care about it. And on transmitters, if you'd buy, if you wanted a name brand transmitter, that was really kind of the end of my concern. But I said, if you know this, if you've had it somewhere, if you can take responsibility for this, that was a good hire. But, but the big thing was ability to pick the order of the jobs and an unflappability because People would comment on that. You'd pick up the phone and say, okay, there'd been an explosion somewhere, a fire somewhere. And you hang up the phone and said, you took that well. and said, you want to panic? There's a bucket over there. You can pull out any number of bigger problems. You just, it's kind of like MASH talked about surgery. You get through a process of repetition, repetition, you get fast at it. But that was kind of our thing. But also, we treated the station as if it was yours from the doorbell to the fire escape. This is yours. Does that answer your question? Does that make any sense? Well, it certainly gives uh, the engineer the respect that he doesn't get in many, in many cases. I mean, uh, one out of three managers that I can remember respected the tech department. The other two thought it was simply a cost loss. Place. We were a little better with our managers because there too, we didn't replace them very quickly. And the company was old enough and went back far enough that they kind of liked their engineers, that they'd all been family together in much smaller situations. We were, I always said we were a lot like Susquehanna. We had grown from very medium market, if not small market roots. We were flying somewhere. Um, we didn't have a company plane. One year on a one of the big FM shuffle projects, we were on someone else's plane, and somebody asked me a question like you did. I said, um, "Well, what do you try to do? What are the goals?" I said, "Well, the HBC engineers are bright, pleasant, and rich." And this perks up Mac Titcher, our boss's ear, said, "Okay, that's the new slogan." I said, "Yes, sir." And he said, "What was the old slogan?" We do what we're told. We go where we're kicked. And they all laughed. And I said, no, no, we, I, slogans and mission statements had become a big deal. And I just said, 
we're, we're, we're thinking aspirationally, but we are bright, pleasant, and rich. We are a talent, just like good salespeople, just like good morning shows. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody wants to do it. But to sit there and belittle that or someone who occasionally may risk their neck certainly is risking their family life because they want to keep your radio stations on the air and sounding good and legal and a few other things. Um, and I tried to, to bring in a case. He said, let's think about the negotiating part more often. Because the morning shows, I assure you, if someone said, you're doing 90 things a morning, I need you to do a 91st, morning show would stop to think, okay, what is this worth to you? If I get this 91st thing done, is there a bonus for me? They might eventually, we started getting big time where they had managers and attorneys and such. And I said, the engineers are real bad about taking on things and not asking for more. There was a friend on the East Coast there that he figured out a way to move a Class B right into the middle of his major market station. And after he got done, he figured he'd raise the stick value of the station anywhere between 15 and $20 million at the time. And... To what you just said, David, he went to the GM and said, do, oh, is there a, do I deserve a bonus of some sort? The GM says, no, PDs get bonuses, salespeople get bonuses, engineers don't get bonuses. We had a VP who said that once, and early on, we hadn't figured out how to bonus it. And he said, but it's your job to be on the air. I said, yes, sir, it is, but it's the job of the PD to get higher ratings, better demos the salespeople to get better rates point for point. I said Make more money. Yeah. I said, this ultimately is bottom line and that, that affects everybody. And I don't want that to, you don't ever want to hear that's not my job. However, we started saying, look, it's a question of setting expectations. And we had stations that had, you know, if you were in LA and you were three deep in spares, it's like, look, this is a highly rated, big rated, uh, big billing station. You basically can't be off here. There should not be an unexpected downtime that you aren't prepared for. But there were other smaller signals where if we lose it in the course of a hurricane or an earthquake, it is the last one to come back. And, and honestly, I don't care. I won't be mad. You will not be in trouble. And I think that was what it was. We just And we got to where every project came most every project came with a bonus. If you could do it under budget and ahead of schedule, because, and that's something we lost, I, that I lost control of toward the end was, you couldn't work on one project because the fact that you had people working on that project would offend the recipient of some other. If you're building a control room for the Tonight Show and they find out the Today Show got something, to use another company's IP, I'd be yell, I'd be having screaming matches with some attorneys. Said, Why are you paying money to have this? This our morning show will not think they're loved if they find out this other project's getting built. And it's different pile of money, different set of contractors, different set of deadlines. The work both projects have to happen. Oh no, not if it's going to cause this morning show to catch cold and refuse to show up for the next month. And I don't see any of that now. I do miss some of the people. I miss things like expense accounts, uh, flying on private planes with the boss. On the other hand, my mom and pops call to tell me they love me and what they've built me for Christmas or it's not here. One of my clients made me a station jacket, station polo shirt, and she has a sewing machine that is computer controlled. And she can tell you how many stitches there are in that logo. Nice lady. Hmm. Very nice. Bill, I see your hands up again. Yeah, I just, I, I, it wasn't in broadcasting, but I worked for a guy uh, in networking uh, for a, a CEO, actually, who maybe I think had it dialed in. He 
he was basically a sales marketing guy, but but his feeling was that he paid uh, sales and mar- incented sales and marketing guys with money. It was the only way to drive them, he thought, and that was the way he did it. Uh, his philosophy about about um, uh, engineering and technical sort of people was that if you give them a clean, well lit place with lots of 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 good tools and interesting projects to work on, that's what that's what their reward is. <clears throat> and uh, and really, uh, um, if 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 you give them more money, they they still st- spend all night in the lab. Uh, and have no no place to spend it, so just give them interesting things to to work on. And I, I guess I have to, at some level, agree. So long as my bills get paid, if I have, I'd rather work at an interesting job than than something that I come to work and do the same thing every day, day after day after day. That's one of the great things about radio, whether it's the air work or it's tech. Uh, it's a different job every day or you could make it a different job every day i always liked the immediacy of the business until it became completely automated and there's no immediacy whatsoever uh, i like the fact that in the day we had generally an auxiliary transmitter so that should something happen uh, to the main and in the old tube transmitters it could and did so it wasn't like uh, you didn't expect things from time to time. Yes, I know in the biggest of markets, there were guys that ran 250Ks at the same time, went into a dummy load just in case they had to switch over at any given moment. Um, I think that's a little bit kill, but if the station wants to pay for that, I suppose that's their business. You can keep the filaments on. Yeah. Uh, stations did that. And uh, with some tubes, that would poison the uh, the tube. Uh, I seem to recall that uh, lesson from Econco somewhere. And you wouldn't want to leave that on all the time. And the glass bulbs, yeah, probably could get away with it. I'd like to turn our attention for the moment uh, to the topic I mentioned earlier of the uh, consultants, the RPEs. And it's like the old uh, David Letterman thing, you know, a touch of uh, touch with greatness. Uh, so that's what, you know, you find yourself talking to somebody that you never thought you'd be talking to. And you find out that they're quite different from what you thought. Uh, I always enjoyed the uh, Ron and Ben show at the NAB, uh, Rackley and Dawson. And when I got to know Ron, what a what a great guy he was. Sharp as a tack. Now, you may have other consulting engineers in mind. And uh, Walt, aren't, aren't, is that what you've done for most of your life? And uh, doing that sort of work. Um, and there's some really good ones out there. Some really inventive ones. Glenn Clark was, was a terror with all those computers. And if you take a look at that one station he designed up in the Detroit area, it was 1270 or 1280. It's got like nine towers. It's like somebody threw darts at a board because they're not in any line at all. But it works. And it it did what the CP said it would do. But I always liked the things I you learn. I remember when we did the AM transmission seminars down in in Orlando. Uh, Ron would come up and uh, spend some time with us, and Ron was the person who had taught me, for instance, uh, to learn and recognize that different makes of transmitters had different output networks. And just because you replaced a five kilowatt gates with a five kilowatt Nautel, for instance, didn't mean you were going to get better audio. In fact, you could get worse audio 
if you did not adjust those output networks or have a uh, uh, intermediate network to do the matching. And I learned that and son of a gun, it's true. If you change transmitter manufacturers and you do not give attention, this is AM I'm talking, uh, attention to that output network, you can sound totally different and not in a good way. So who's your favorite consultant? Or your favorite consultant story? Carl T. Jones for AM. I did some work with uh, Ralph DePel of uh, Cohen and DePel. And then also went to the uh, Carl Smith um, DA seminars in Cleveland a long, long time ago. Carl was just the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. I only got to meet him during the NAB uh, DA seminar in Cleveland. But I was just amazed uh, at, at how much he cared and how sharp he was. I also had one of his books with all the patterns in it that was generated uh, mechanically, which was uh, amazing. I've either got the book or somebody sent me a photocopy of all the patterns. Um, but yeah, that that's very in yeah. In the days before transmitter uh, computers, how would you know what the what the array was going to do? Uh, David, you're right. Uh, Twelve seventy WXYT. And they also added a bunch of towers. I don't know that Glenn didn't do that. But yeah, he would sit there with the room full of computers, uh, you know, hot rotting things. When we rebuilt the 870 in the Vegas area, simple DA, it was three towers before and after. But uh, the Rackley people redesigned the nine phaser and just played with the phase budget a little bit. And it sounded like an entirely new radio station that. You know, to look at a couple of parts got moved, but nothing got replaced, really. The um, every region, of course, we used to have so many more consultants because we didn't all have computers to do these things. But there were Merle Saxons. There were uh, there was a guy in San Antonio named Lynn Willoughby who retired a couple of years ago. Yeah, that looks like you just threw the sticks on the ground. It's like so many pretzels on the table and. You know, it's not just an optimized pattern shape. It's, you know, was optimized for bandwidth. And the the very deepest minimums there didn't necessarily sound awful. You know, they had to give some thought to, can listeners still listen to this? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point, I guess, for another discussion. And, and that is just like the so-called non-directional FMs, uh, once you mount them on the side of a tower, AM directionals, they have a, or they have a tendency uh, to only be cared about at carrier. And you get five or 10 kilohertz off carrier and those minima aren't really minima anymore. It, yeah, it was, they weren't planned for anything except, okay, the pattern at carrier. And of course, Murphy says that your program, you know, pick the, the deepest minimums, take the nulls. It turns off completely. You will find the manager's house, your biggest car dealer's house, the program director morning show. If there's someone who cares about hearing the station, they live in one notch or another. They just do. Uh, yeah, my, there's, my, a, there's a requirement, I think, in their contract. It's Pete Skagsnell passed a lived out east of town, almost dead in line with the KAMA towers, which, you know, you follow that no, you follow that that line uh, back to WSB uh, in Atlanta, which it protected rather deeply. And Pete could just sit there and watch the four lights flash. But there were nights you could sit in his driveway and he could hear he could hear Atlanta. But I always thought uh, Rackley was one of my favorites of the bigs. I always liked Ben Dawson. The different firms, usually the head people were really, uh, were really smart. Some of them were really pleasant. A few of them were not. 
But I remember in some of the regional firms or the smaller firms, you'd have people that weren't real kind to green local engineers. I had one fellow I was asking questions he's like, yeah, it's probably beyond your average station chief. And I thought maybe, but this average station chief does sign the POs and the check request and whatnot. He said, meaning what? I said, it really be a shame if in my idiot, you know, my stupidity, I forgot how to sign my name and you stopped getting paid. <laughs> and his boss was really quite a good one, but like I say, just staff guy, he was a creep. Did you ever deal with uh, Ver James? With the firm, yeah, we would get underlings. Um, Oscar Leon Cuellar, we got, and there was a fellow named Oscar Slim, yeah, Eeyore something. How was it pronounced, uh, Ken? I heard when they did 1270, Charles called him Ihor. It might have uh -huh. been Ihor, but Slim was his nickname. Yeah. Yeah, they built that, and we did a big, we didn't rebuild it. We, we kind of replaced everything except the dirt under it. And upped it 10 times. And raised the power quite a bit. Yeah, we did. And I got Jack uh, Selmeyer in to see it once, and he really, he found one thing to pick, and I had to concede he was probably right. We had put fiberglass insulators at the top and bottom of the guy wires, and he was worried that a grass fire would have breached the, the bottom insulators. And I'm like, okay, you know, I think you're right. He also said, well, I never had that much money to spend on a project. I, I don't think that is necessarily true, but he really thought we had built something there. Considering over the years where that station started and where it ended up, that was quite an improvement. Yeah, and even we rebuilt it in 2006, did the power increase. And Patrick and I have both said that, you know, if it were a year or two later, we wouldn't have bothered. 2006 was probably too late, just the number of dollars for what an AM was going to be. For the money we spent, we could have made the down payment on a better signal. Or an it, FM. Yeah, well, we had we were full up on those, but I see Bert Weiner's with us. Mr. Bert. Oh, I am here. What uh what's the craziest station there that you've worked for in LA? I know that you started out with KFAC, because we've talked about that. Well, before that even. KBMS it's a background music station. It's now K Power 105.9. But when I was in junior high school, I worked for KBMS as a board operator, transmitter person, you know, whatever else. And uh, is this better if I bring my microphone down to where my mouth is? Yeah, much better. Oh, I thought I, something didn't feel right. Had the microphone in the wrong place. I thought in the wrong end. Um, no, KBMS, when I was in junior high school, it was a background music service. Back then, it was cheaper to put an FM station on the air than it was to get phone lines into various businesses, restaurants, markets, things like that. And uh, KBMS... Uh, was around 3,000 watts ERP, but we upped it to, what was it, uh, 105,000 watts when it was on Flint Peak. It was 105,000 watts, yeah. But um, KFAC was good. That was one of those things, well, a misunderstanding on my part. When I went to KFAC, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And uh, that I would, that would be one of those places that I would work for the rest of my life because I love classical music and I loved the people I was working with. But that was about the time when uh, stations started selling, you know, every other day. And, uh, you know, uh, there was no longevity to anything there. You were lucky if you could hang on. And usually when a new manager came along, he brought along his buddy, chief engineer, 
or uh, you know, the when a new company came in, they came in with their own engineers. Uh, so anyway, I uh, after many years, I discovered I'd be better off working for myself, and that was uh, probably the best move I ever made. But that's a different thing. Uh, so what was your question? Well, I'll just take, first of all, a, a pitch at what you just said about what happens when stations are sold. I think that's one of the things that I always appreciated about Univision or Tishner or Hispanic or whatever label you were under at the time, David. It was the respect that you guys had for your staff and the turnover was relatively low. Yeah, we did okay. We had a couple of, of exes online yesterday, uh, today, and they might have a different opinion of it, but it really, we tried to minimize the paperwork and just, just nonsense work, uh, busy work that the engineering managers saw. And we all, the chiefs were always engineering managers because you were controlling a, a significant budget, but also it was, uh, once upon a time, we didn't buy things in tandem, that the bigger we got, the more the consultants and by consultants, folks from what had been the auditing firms, your McKinsey's at all would start showing up. And it's like, yeah, we're going to do this thing. And it's like, I see. And how has that worked for you? That was the most important phrase I ever learned was how has that worked for you? Someone call and say, huh, your station's not making any money. We're going to change format. I'm like, good. How has that worked for you? Well, I haven't tried it. Okay, a friend of yours you work with has done it. Well, no. And you would just have to learn to kind of push them off at a distance and say, why do you believe this? I mean, you could be totally right, but pretend for a second I'm as smart as you are. And convince me. And I would always say, you know, as you think you are, because they always thought they were brilliant. So, Bert, to come back to you, what was this? craziest strangest station in the number two market in the country and where they make millions and millions of dollars hand over fist and you walked in the door and saw what it ran like a pinball machine <laughs> it was interesting to see some stations where you'd walk in and they had this big sound on the air and they presented themselves as uh you know, a uh, huge complex of studios and everything. And when you go in the door, what you really saw was a computer on a card table. <laughs> and that was it. In L.A. In L.A. Uh, I won't go into who, but yes. Um, I don't know. I've seen so many strange things. I, I guess the one person that was a real mess. I worked for, I didn't work for him, but I did some consulting work for him was a fellow by the name of uh, Bob Burdett, who I, I think to become a part of uh, a Los Angeles broadcasting folklore, you had to have been, pardon me for using the term screwed by him once that was, that was a, a part of a ritual. Um, I got a call from him one time and he said, Hey, I'm off the air and I need some help. Well, so we kind of dropped what we were doing. You know, when fellow broadcasters off the air, you really want to get out there and help them get back on as fast as possible. So, uh, my buddy Fletch and I go tearing out there and here is a RCA BT F 250, the one with the Iron Fireman Exciter, and um, it's, um, uh, you know, a pair of 4125s in the final. Well, uh, we get out there and we find this transmitter's half underwater. What happened is he was out in a piece of land out in the west side, I don't know, Montebello. I'm trying to remember exactly where it was. We're talking 40 some odd years ago. 
and the city uh, needed to put landfill there. And he refused to work with the city. The city was going to put him, help relocate him to a higher piece of land, you know, within 100 feet. And he refused to allow them to do it. So they, the city owned the land that he was on. And they, the city was being very fair about it, but he refused to move. So what the city eventually did was they filled the land in all around him and left him in a pit that was probably 10 or 12 feet deep. And to get down to the transmitter building, which the roof was below grade at this point, you had to kind of slide down the dirt to get to it. Well, we just had a bunch of rain and the building was full of water. The pit was full of water. The transmitter, if you're familiar with an RCA BTF 250, it's about seven feet tall almost. Uh, it was the meters at the very top of the transmitter were half underwater. So we looked at this thing and there was no way to get this thing back on the air. But somehow, being creative, we did get it back on there. We had to pump the water out. And then we went through the transmitter and fixed it and got it working again somehow. And we sent them a bill. Okay. You know, the, how we got the transmitter going again, that's one story. But the interesting part of it, when it came time, we sent them hit them the bill, which was probably $500 for two of us doing this. And it was certainly worth a lot more than that. But anyway, he says, no, 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 you don't understand. I do everything in trade. And he says, what I want to do is instead of the $500, I'm going to send the two of you to Austria for lunch. So we thought, well, hey, you know, a trip to Austria could be nice. But no, 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 you're going to go there. You're going to get off the plane. You're going to go have lunch. You're going to get back on the plane and come back. I said, what? So um, he called me a few other times and it was always cash up front before I'd even talk to him. I'd figure out how much I wanted and also to get the previous money back. So we um, so this is this went along for several years. Then one day I went out there to, to, to consult with him on a project. Uh, the guy had, uh, the guy had, um, one, he, he moved his transmitter site to a, a small hill over in the, um, uh, El Monte area. I think it was, uh, Jim, you know, the place I'm thinking of the 98.3. Jim Sensenbach knows the transmitter site. Um, but anyway, when he, he was trying to save money everywhere he could, being a cheapskate. So the antenna was up on the tower, brought it down through. It was a, a, a solid tower, like you have a utility pole that has metal all the way around it, and it's hollow inside. He brought the coax down that and then through a an underground conduit and up along the side of the transmitter. And he had worked out a deal with the suppliers where whatever coax he didn't use, he could return and get credit for. So in order to do this and, and keep the coax as short as possible, he forgot, apparently forgot that he needed some way to connect the trans, the transmission line, the coax, to the top of the transmitter. So he, where it came up the side of the transmitter to the edge of the top of the transmitter, he cut it off right there. And now he needed to know, what do I do to connect the, that to the top of the transmitter? Well, I said, well, what you're going to have to do, probably the simplest thing to do is you're going to have to put a connector on there, then a piece of, you know, 
a couple elbows and some trans uh, copper transmission line over and onto the top of the transmitter. Okay. So I went home and I forgot to collect money up front. So I sent him a bill for a hundred dollars. And he calls me on the phone and he starts screaming at me, a hundred dollars. You didn't fix it. You didn't solve my problem. I says, no, but I told you what needed to be done. That's my consulting fee, which was a bargain, you know, at the time. And so uh, he says, well, I'm not going to pay it. So I hung up on him. The next month, I sent him a bill for the hundred dollars plus a late fee. And he called me up and he went into orbit. And uh, same, so I, I did this for, I don't know, probably a year. Every month I would add on a late fee. And uh, he would call me up and scream bloody murder. Well, I never did get paid. He dropped dead of a heart attack. And, and I'm hoping in a way that I was able to contribute to that. But I got to tell you, I made my money in my satisfaction in listening to him go into orbit every month. It was it was money well spent or well lost. But uh, this was in an L.A. market and it was a popular station. They played big band. And uh, that was one of the one place where they had a, uh, a an old Western electric mixer on a card table and two old RCA turntables. And that was it. But anyway, uh, there's been other strange ones, but that that's the uh, the prize winner right there. Getting paid as a contract engineer was always fun. Um, we had a, a station that was uh, owned by an attorney who was very slow or no pay. So we hired an attorney to uh, sue him. And it turned out uh, our attorney had gone to law school with the guy. So his first letter is, uh, Dear Leonard, how nice to hear your name again, my clients, and continued on. So um, we, we won the uh, lawsuit in court and then uh, attached his uh, bank account um, just, just before payroll went out. So we, we ended up getting paid. One thing about late fees is uh, we had an interest charge, uh, I think, 1.5% per month, uh, which was fairly standard. And the judge said, unless the um, party had, uh, you know, agreed to that in writing, it wasn't valid. So we had to go down to some uh, default uh, rate determined by the state of California. But we still got uh, the uh, principal and interest. Uh, another story about this same station was it's a 900 kilohertz here in Los Angeles was it's still there, but it's a different station now altogether is I went out there one time to fix his remote control. It was an old, uh, I think it was a Gates RRC 10, something like that. And uh, I'm trying to think where it was controlled from because it was um, the uh, studio was at the Oh, no, it was the FM that was remote control, and I was out there. And while I'm working on the remote control, I noticed that the on-air talent person, the DJ, walks over to the front of the AM transmitter, which was a, a RCA BTA 1R1. And he opens the door, and he's got a towel in his hand, and he reaches in there, and he whaps something. So. Okay, I'm there a couple hours, and during my couple hours there, this was uh, 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 happened about three or four times. So finally, I asked the guy, I "says What's that all about? What are you What are you doing? How come you open that every once in a while?" And uh, yeah, hold hold on just a moment here, please. Yeah. Okay. So um, he says, well, the filament goes out on uh, one of the tubes. I said, you're, you're kidding. So that's, 
he says, yeah, we just have to go over and hit it every once in a while. And um, so you just sort of disappeared. No, no, yeah, yeah, I did. Hold on just one moment here. I'm sorry. Uh, we'll be back after this word. Well, hey. The art of percussive maintenance. Yes, the art of percussive maintenance. Um, let's see here if I do that. There I am again. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, the station sign, it was a day timer, so it signed off. And being a good guy, trying to be a good guy, I said, well, I got to go see what's going on with this. And I, those of you who are familiar with the BTA-1 are one know that there's a phenolic board and the, the, the tubes sit in this and the, the pins are removable. It's all kind of a RCA Mickey Mouse tube socket, if you will. They're individual pins. There's holes in the phenolic and then down and there's the pin there. Well, one of the pins and the one for the filament was uh, had fatigued so bad from heat that it's barely making contact. So they had a ton of uh, stuff there. And I uh, went through the spare parts and I found another pin. So I take this thing apart and I'm going to put this new pin in. And in doing so, I drop a, uh, a internal star lock washer down into the plate transformer. The windings are, it's an open frame transformer and it goes in there. Now I'm thinking, oh God, now what? I got to get that thing out of there before, you know, it happened to fall into the open side of the high voltage winding, uh, open, physically open. So I must have spent two, maybe three hours and I finally managed to fish that washer out of there. And I got it working. I solved this problem, but that's one of those things that I was not asked to do, I shouldn't have done as no good deed goes unpunished. That's, that's what that was about. So same station, same guy. When one time, many years ago, we had our hundred year flood. That was 1983 in Tucson. It rained and it rained and it rained. We were actually cut off. The internet inter, interstate was uh, flooded at both ends of the city. Uh, there were certain areas of the city that could only be reached by helicopter. And we're in the desert, thank you. And I was like one of only two or three techs in the city at the time. And every time I turned around, a different station was calling because they were off the air and they wanted me to get them back up and one of them was owned by a guy who ran around with a paperback copy of winning through intimidation in his back pocket and he wasn't a client of mine he was just a, a courtesy call from another engineer who was out of town he would call me literally every 10 minutes when i was going to get to his transmitter and I would explain to him that I have to take care of my clients first and get them back on the air. And in due course, I ended out at the transmitter site. And you all know what's next. The phone was ringing on the wall at the transmitter site. Pick the phone up. And yep, it was him. What's wrong? What, what, what'd you do? What? Well, Bill, until I get off the phone, I can't go take a look. And I hung up on him. So I got him back on the air. And I sent him a bill. Two months later, I still hadn't been paid. And I called down to the station, the bookkeeper. And she says, uh, oh, we only pay the same way that we pay our uh, advertising clients, 180 days. I said, well, let's see, you're off the air. You called me out on a rainy night, got you back on the air. Tell you what, I'll let you pay me at this next pay period. Or in future, you can meet me at the door of your transmitter with cash in hand. 
We should say you'll be there in 180 days. Well, it wasn't her fault. It was the it was the manager's fault. The owner manager. And you know, uh, what can you say? What can you do? Occasionally, you'd get the call from someone who was out for the holidays, and maybe you were in town, and he said, "Look, leave the keys, and I'll I'll take care of it if if they call." But you get a call from someone you don't know, and they just assume they're talking to the engineer for the station, and there might only be one on Earth. And I remember one guy calls, and it's, you know, yo yo baby yo, and like we're off, and how are you going to act? And I'm like, okay, who are you? Where are you? What station are we talking about? And what has happened? And he walks through, and we eventually figure out that ah. You have shot yourself in the foot, metaphorically. Uh, you needed to push a button, but you were new to the control room. You pushed the wrong one. So the button you pushed did not reset the EAS. It reset the transmitter. It was, the, it was marked DC slash off or, or uh, off slash reset. This was a QEI remote control. And he pushes it and he said, hey, it's saying uh, warming up. Please wait. It starts counting. I said, okay. Um, get your next music ready and figure out what you're going to say and, you know, get ready to clean up the log for the spots you missed. And while we're waiting, let's talk about what you did. And he said, well, I didn't do anything wrong. He said, well, you called a total stranger and yelled at him. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't really necessary. And the guy's, he's backing down pretty fast. He said, well, I just got hired the other day. I work up in other place and I was going to do this as fill in for the holidays. And that's great. And you now told me enough where, you know, next time I see the program director, I've got to remember to punch him in the mouth, but that's, that's a different relationship story. <laughs> but it was, it, no one stops to say, they'll post a number saying, Hey, I'm out of town. Here's the number. And there might be a post-it, but they don't say, if you call, if you need to call them, be nice to them because they are doing us a favor, or this is something I'm swapping time for him or just. Uh, I got to where I would pay people to watch my stuff <laughs> because I wanted the luxury of being able to say, I don't necessarily want to do yours. It was the proverbial 3 a.m. phone call from a local station here that was not mine, but it was being uh, chiefed by a fellow who was at that time was a friend. And the guy is on the other line and he says the, Number six cart machine isn't working. Kind of shook off the sleep a little bit. And I said, let me get this straight. You have five cart machines that work fine. And number six isn't. And you want me to do something about it right now. Well, it's a whole lot easier if I have all six. How many think I hung up at that point? Well, I'd want to know how broken. I got a call like that because the lights weren't blinking. Uh, weren't blinking together. <laughs> and you just I'd have kind gone of, down and put an out of order sign on cart number six and build him. I, uh, you, you know, we're talking about people that don't pay. I had one situation that was the extreme opposite. I, um, I'm sure many of you know who Gene Scott was, uh, Dr. Gene Scott. Uh, and he was, when back in the analog days of satellite, his signal, he was always on Telstar 5, Transponder 5, I think it was. And it was always good because you could tell where you were, in, you know, in the arc. Just tune around till you found a guy chomping on a cigar with a beard. Um, anyway, so, uh, he calls me one time, calls me one day on the phone and he says, I got a real problem. He said, my, um, uh, I'm having problems with my satellite system. He says, my studio, there's something wrong with the microwave between the studio and the uplink, which is a, on the uh, studios on one side of Glendale transmitter, the uplinks on the other side of Glendale probably about a, a three mile path, 23 gigs. So I dial it up on my satellite and I look at it and you can see all this 
distortion and everything in the picture from, uh, you know, multipath in the FM microwave signal in the video. So I call him up and I says, yeah, I'll come on down there now. But I said, I want to ask you something. He says, you have a habit of not paying people. I want some assurance that I'm going to get paid. He says, I promise you, I will pay you. So, okay, I'll just take my chances. And I go down there and he, by the way, he sends me uh, a fax with well, some fax days, no real internet stuff. He faxes me a letter that says my uh, invoice will be paid paid promptly and his signature. So I go down there, I solve the problem. It was a tree had grown up in the middle of the path and I moved his uh, 23 gig link about 20 feet over on the roof and that solved the problem. So I sent him a bill. Three days later, I get a check in the mail. Great, deposit it, check is good all done week goes by i get another check in the mail from him same amount and i called his office up and i said um i introduced myself and i said i just received a check from you folks but you've or you've already paid this amount so she says oh she says just void it and uh, send it back so i do that a week or so later comes by goes by Here's another check, same amount for the same invoice number. I call her on the phone and I said, uh, you tried to pay this. You paid me for this and now you're paying it again. And, and this is the second time that you've double paid it. And she says, oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, she says, just write void on it, tear it up and put it in the trash. OK, so I did that. Another week goes by. Guess what? <laughs> this went on for a total of about seven weeks or seven times. And I finally uh, called them on the phone and said, listen, you keep doing this. Any more checks that come uh, connected with this invoice number, I will cash and I will accept them as a tip on my work so thank you so i mean um it was neat they stayed when i said that that was the end of it i never heard from him again but it was really nice that uh he paid that well which was a miracle in southern california here was this the guy that had strange video effects during his preaching like the camera would move in and out and there would be some kind of weird feedback trailing. Uh, I don't through. recall because I didn't watch him, but I know he had his FCC monkey band and uh, he, he was taking, he was telling, you know, people that they had to donate. Then he would show videos of what their latest donation had gone to. And he had bought racehorses with them, with the donations and people kept sending the money. And, so um he since passed it's been a bunch of years now and i understand his daughter is running it and uh it's just as bad yeah we had one of these over here jim baker oh yeah i used to when i worked at channel nine i i i was the uh td for that at our end i had to sit through and listen to it yeah, he was also on the FM subcarrier for Susquehanna in Dallas, Fort Worth. Yeah, there was a local disc jockey that had a skit a couple of times a week called Pass the Loot Club that would uh, satirize his going zones. Doc Scott came on in Lubbock for the first time. He would show way late at night. I mean, 11, 12 o'clock, saw the owner of the station at some point and asked about him. He said, oh, I'm putting station on in Amarillo and I need a transmitter. So he swapped the transmitter for a bunch of airtime. But the first night he's going through some prayer requests and somebody says, 
He's reading the card said, okay, we're happy you're on an Amarillo next card. You know, happy you're on an Amarillo. Great, you're on an Amarillo. No sound in Amarillo. Called the station. There's no answer. And he kept going through it saying, you know, I don't have to hear too many voices from above to know there's no sound in Amarillo. Remember one night he'd wear a little cap and he would have like two pairs of glasses on. Uh, he was just, just a very odd duck uh, on your late night TV. He probably kept paying that check and paying that check and paying that check because it's the first time they'd ever done that. And we just, yeah, we're just not experienced in paying bills. Right, right. But are you saying people are weird that wear two sets of glasses like I do? His was, it was kind of like an airplane where Robert Stack pulls off the dark glasses and there's another pair under it. He said, okay, we've got a face fax and he pulls them off and there's another pair. Um, Okay, if Melissa Scott is his daughter, uh, she rocks the high black boots a lot better than I think he would have. Uh, she'll cover a blackboard with, you know, theology, and I'm like, drat, I flunk that. I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't say she's wrong because I don't understand it. I don't think I've ever watched her or ever seen her. Um, I, you know, it's not my cup of tea nor mine, but now that we've, I, and I see less of this and probably there are fewer people who will see it because all I see of TV anymore is what's on the program guide. You look at only the things you select and the old days you were actually clicking through the channels and you would see these things. And, uh, I, I think there's so much less chance of accidentally seeing a show anymore. Well, he supposedly performed a lot of miracles, probably based on how much of a donation you sent in. But I heard he actually made a blind man walk. <laughs> you say made him walk in what way? Forced him to? It was very comfortable. Said, you want to get home, you're going to have to walk. That was how he did it. I see. Took it may not a, a dubious miracle, I suppose. Well, the idea would be a blind man seeing to say that you made a blind man walk. It's not quite so dramatic. Oh, that's Bill, like, you know, that puts the hand on the other foot. Yes. Bill. Yeah. I don't want to derail the Dr. Scott, uh, discussion. That's, that's exciting. <laughs> I just, kind of uh, cheer, kind of cheer I, with a cigar 24 hours a day. I just wanted to, to, to make note to Bert that I actually, I worked for KBMS, uh, in 1965, uh, uh, for a while before I was drafted <laughs> and, uh, uh, as a, as a receiver technician, I used to go around in, in, a in a, uh, Corvair van that I was provided, uh, and, uh, and troubleshoot, uh, receiver sites, receiver installations. And, uh, that was actually meant the first broadcast job that I ever had that really actually paid money uh, reliably every week. Um, but that probably was that was the same for me. I probably built some of those receivers. We built all of our own receivers. But were those SCA receivers or main carrier receivers? Yeah, so they were SCA receivers. And I think it was Dale Rice that came up with the idea that in some of the really fringy areas that that you couldn't get a good signal, that, that you know, since uh, KBMS ran the same uh, audio on the main as on the, as on the SCA with the exception of the of the uh, commercial spots and IDs, wouldn't it be just as easy to have a uh, uh, carrier sensor uh, mute the audio and uh, with uh, uh, an SCA carrier sensor mute the audio and just uh, play the uh, main audio to the customer? Well, um, hard to say. I'd have to figure out how it was done because there was a rule that came along that forced the SCAs uh in that uh you could not do anything that would delete the main channel audio for example they used what they called the beeper tone which was really a 20.4 kilohertz tone 
that they would transmit along with anything they did not want to go into the restaurant, and that would mute the receivers. And people said, well, why 20.4? I said, well, because at that time, there were a million 20.4 surplus crystals you could get for a penny a piece from JJ Glass, places like that. Anyway. Was it was it crystals or was it like like those like Motorola uh, subaudible? Uh, the the ones things. that the one that KBMS had, and I know uh, KUTE also did the same thing. One hundred one point nine. Um, they used a, a crystal. Yeah, it was pretty pretty interesting times. I remember when they went from Flint Peak to Mount Wilson. Or I guess it happened after I left, but they they went from Flint Peak to Mount Wilson, and they went from a respectable uh, power down to about 320 watts or something on Wilson. I think it was 650 watts or something like that, 640. Um, yeah, that was they put that signal was lousy because they put it behind a, a bunch of towers. I. Uh, the company I was doing work for at the time bought it. We wound up moving it to another site up on Mount Wilson where it was out in the front and it worked much better, uh, much, much better. Um, who owned, was it Bill Scott and Al Schwartz when you were there? I don't recall. I, I did, uh, you know, I had uh, most of the contact I had was with, with uh, Dale and I've actually lost track of where Dale is or what he's doing. If anything, these days, he smokes like a chimney and may not be around. There was a fellow named Dale Cook that was involved with Muzak at one time that I worked with. And I think he had been involved with him at one time. But a, another story about uh, KBMS that people might find humorous or interesting. Yeah, there were two owners of it. Uh, there was Bill Scott, who was the technical side of it. Bill was a real good guy. And Al Schwartz, who I'm not sure, I guess more the business side of it. But Bill was quite capable of doing the business side of it. Anyway, these two guys hated each other. I mean, with a passion. And I remember one night, uh, me and a buddy from high school, who was also a, one of the op board operators there, too. And we did all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, Bill Scott called us and said, Hey, got to go up and work on the transmitter tonight. Uh, would you guys like to come up and help? And yeah, we did. It was a Friday night or Saturday night. I forget which, but anyway, we went up there. We actually had to work on the antenna. He, he climbed up the, the tower, uh, the pole and, uh, took a couple bays off and we reworked those. But, um, Bill uh, Al Schwartz, who lived oh about a half a mile airline from the uh, transmitter, called the tra called the studio and they said, "Well, they're up there working on the transmitter." So then he calls the transmitter. He gets a hold of Bill, and he says, "I could hear him from you know where I was standing. I could hear his voice screaming out of the phone. I want my radio station back on now." And Bill said, we've got the antenna down. We're working on it. We're making some repairs on it. This is the middle of the night. And uh, he says, I don't care. I don't want to hear any excuses. I want my radio station back on the air now. And Bill hung up on him. And he went and he pulled the cable out of the exciter that uh, went to the rest of the transmitter. And... Uh, he this was a phasotron ge three kilowatt transmitter and uh he took a test lead out of uh, uh, his 260 simpson and stuck it stuck it in the end of the coax connector out of the exciter called the studio and tell him to start programming again and uh, al could hear it at his house which was like i say just a short distance away and i remember Bill saying, well, I hope that shuts him up for a while. So, uh, but he was happy. He thought his radio station was back on the air, but uh, there was, he made a lot of people really unhappy 
uh, Al did. And Bill, you know, spent most of his time uh, smoothing down feathers. And, you know, he, he was really a good guy, sharp. It's amazing how far 10 watts will go. Yeah. And once you reach quieting, any more is just a waste of a waste of energy. Yeah, I'm going to have to guess that when I was there, it was 1957, 58, somewhere in there. Yeah, a long time before I arrived, but um, it was it was uh, it was it was a good a good bridge from from high school. Uh, I had a brief job at Munt Stereo Pack, and then I do dove headlong right into the big world of of broadcast radio engineering. <laughs> Although the KBMS job was was. Uh, kind of at the other end of the transmitter. You know, I've been in that building up on Flint Peak, I don't know how many times since on various projects, uh, NRSC proofs, things like that. And I've been looking for any sign of KBMS's existence, markings on the telephone backboard, anything. Um, the, the part of the building that they were in has been reworked. And there were two stations in there now. The room had been divided. But when I, they added a generator to it. And they, in doing so, they added a very large cement pad and brick wall around the area where this generator is. And in digging, in di doing this, they dug up an old part of an old tower that uh, was the actual KBMS tower. And it was a, a piece of angle, probably inch and a half on a side. And it had been cut out with a cutting torch. And it was about maybe 10 inches long. Well, there were two pieces like this. So I got them. I, I got them and I wrote on them the last recognizable piece of KBMS. And I sent one off to my buddy, Gordon Wright who lives in uh, Iowa now, but he was the other fellow that from my uh, high school that worked there too. So, but that's the, those are the last two pieces of KBMS. Although I do have a picture of the KBMS studio. I have two pictures that Gordon found in uh, uh, Barry for what it's worth. I will send them to you later. Okay. Uh, the board was a, um, uh, a, Gate Studioette, uh, C52 CS, I believe it was. It's the earlier Studioette. And the tape decks were 10-inch uh, Ampex machines. They were, I forget what model they were. They were uh, vertical rack mount, um, one reel above the other, and the head nest in the middle, of course. And um, these were re reversing decks, and uh, the 25 cycle tone would reverse the deck. And there was a uh, one he used to, he used to get all these different actors on there that would say, "Hi, my name is so and so, and I listen to KBMS," you know. And there was one on there that had John Wayne on it. Well, they didn't have the 25 cycle generator to make these things reverse. What he did was uh, he had a silent sensor that they built. Uh, and the automation machine was like a pachinko machine upside down in a rack. And uh, th there's this one. It happened every single time this this voice ID tape came up and had the um, uh uh, John Wayne, he says, hi, this is John Wayne. And I want you to know that And the thing would reverse because there was something in the background on the tape that triggered the reverser or the, the reversing circuitry. 
And they said, and this is John Wayne. And remember, I'm a singer. And that was it. There was the, the end of the voice track, the announcement in the opposite direction. Did it every time. My, my recollection of that automation system was that it was like all these stepper relays and they had like dials uh, underneath uh, on a control plate for each each uh, 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 and rotary switches that you could set for what I guess what sequence came next and it was like counting as it went through between between segments. Uh, and it was, I guess, interesting to watch, but it was the d days before they, before there was anything like a, a computer to run it. Uh, and and uh, um, I don't know who, who built those things, but, but it was, uh, uh, must have been some relative of Rube Goldberg's. Well, yeah, a relative of Rube Goldberg. Uh, in the pictures that I'll send Barry and he can put them up if he wants to is a is some pictures of the automation but not very detailed you can just see it in, in the racks there but it was built by uh, bill scott and it was is really kind of clever but it was uh it was just there was a chassis but nothing was bolted to the chassis it was upside down chassis well on rack panels with things just wired together laying in there and uh it uh it worked. I thought they used clear leader uh, uh, on between segments on those things. Uh, you're probably thinking of some some Schaefer equ automation equipment. Uh, Schaefer did that, especially on their spotters, which were an interesting device by themselves. A lot of fa fantastic stories behind those, but. Um, no, they didn't use uh, uh, transparent in, transparency in the tape on the uh, KBMS stuff. 25 hertz was common in automation, and it'd be at the end of each song, and that was when Drake Chenault pioneered the way of staggering when the tones would be, and they could have the two reels work so that the fellow talking would continue talking over the intro to the next song and it sounded more alive, but you would have uh, 25 Hertz in one, one side left or right. And then the other would have a different effect. Well, what uh, Schaefer did is they, they had rigged it up so that when the 25 Hertz tone started, it would start the next tone, uh, start the next deck and they would overlap. And when it, it would, you, you know, they would both be on. And when the 25 cycles dropped off, um, it would release the first deck or the audio relay for that deck. Um, I, I worked for Schaefer during the time that was uh, the 800 yep. and 800, 800 series tube type. And then the 800 T, which is the transistor when I was involved in uh, uh, development of that. And uh, I because I worked in the lab there. Hey, we did like, everything. Looks like David Gleason got his microphone open. Is it working, David? Oh no, I spoke too soon. I, I thought that I thought they used uh, those clear leaders so they could like seek and fast forward for another for the next piece. Uh, that was the spotter that did that. Um, I don't think they had any other machines later that used that for skipping through. We made use of that one uh, at 91X when we first came on the air. We were doing the, uh, our studios were in San Diego and of course the, uh, the transmitter was in Tijuana. And, um, so we would record one hour in each in at um, in one reel to reel and then another hour in the other and we would embed that 25 cycle tone at the end of the one and so um if you did it right you could actually make it sound like a segue uh but the problem came in is that because there was a six hour delay 
uh, we ran in the, you know, you couldn't do that too much because uh, otherwise the times would be incorrect. So then we had other little songs that we would put in to correct for that. 